Doppler evaluation of TIPS shunts. I'm going to take this topic in four steps. First talk a little bit about portal hypertension, the reason why most TIPS shunts are placed. Then a little bit about placement and maintenance of the shunt. Finally, some principles of Doppler surveillance. And finally, some problems or caveats that you might have to deal with when you do ultrasound of these devices. Most hip shunts are done in people with cirrhosis. In the United States, the vast majority of people with cirrhosis acquire the disease from either an alcoholic or viral etiology. Biliary cirrhosis, hematochromatosis make up a smaller minority, and then there's a host of other things that can cause that. Worldwide, however, viral causes take a more preeminent position. The physiology of portal hypertension is such that the liver disease impedes blood flow through the liver, which increases portal venous pressure. As a result, portal systemic collaterals will develop. By definition, when the portal pressure exceeds 12 millimeters mercury, the patient is diagnosed with portal hypertension. Portal pressure is defined by the portal vein pressure minus the pressure in the inferior vena cava. There are three complications of portal hypertension, intractable ascites, variceal bleeding, and hepatic encephalopathy. And TIP shunts are used to address these, and particularly the first two complications of portal hypertension. The performance of TIP shunts has been remarkable over the last 10 or 20 years. TIPs have demonstrated to significantly improve the quality of life of recipients, and they perform as well or better than other ways of treating variceal bleeding and ascites. There are several things that can be done for the treatment of hypertension. Certainly diuretics are used to treat fluid overload. Surgical shunts can be placed. Sclerotherapy has been used on occasion, and now TIPS shunts have taken an important uh, position in the treatment of this disease. Placement and maintenance of TIPS shunts. This is what a typical TIPS shunt uh, looks like. TIPS stands for transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt because these shunts are placed typically through the jugular vein into the, uh, into the uh, right hepatic vein, and then this conduit is established between the portal system and the right hepatic vein. Typically, the shunt extends from the right hepatic vein to the right portal vein, and the technical success of this procedure is now greater than 90%. Here is an MR study showing the connection between, or the distance between, the right portal vein and the right hepatic vein. So a relatively uh, small amount of liver tissue is actually traversed. Here again is the sh tip shunt in place, and you can see this schematic drawing, the connection between the right portal and the right hepatic veins. Here's a patient with intractable ascites prior to the placement of the tip shunt, and here is a des the desired result. The tip shunt has resulted in the complete resolution of the abdominal fluid. There are complications associated with the tip shunt. Certainly, the uh, patency of the shunt is the m of most interest. This slide illustrates the reason why Doppler surveillance is so important. The one-year patency rate without surveillance is as low as 25%, but with Doppler surveillance, that shunt can be kept open at a rate of about 85%. So there's a strong incentive to, incentive to monitor these shunts. What are some of the complications? Well, certainly stent thrombosis, stent stenosis, and by that I mean there, you get a proliferation of a kind of pseudo intima, or what's called pseudo intimal hyperplasia. You can get stenosis of the draining hepatic vein, and of course, you can get complete occlusion. 
When identified promptly, stenosis or thrombosis can be successfully treated with interventional techniques, particularly balloon angioplasty. Here is an example of pseudointimal hyperplasia that has clogged this tip's shunt. You see it's a kind of fibrofatty deposition. So once an abnormality is identified on Doppler, these patients will go on to venography or portal venography. This is the gold standard, of course. However, it is uh, in an uh, invasive procedure and requires a contrast injection. So this is not the kind of uh, technique that would be used routinely. Here's an example of a portal venogram. A catheter is threaded from the jugular vein through the uh, stent, demonstrating this stenosis of the distal stent, as shown here by the circle. A balloon then can be placed at the area of stenosis and inflated, and here is the result of the balloon angioplasty uh, reestablishment of the uh, full lumen of the tip's shunt. So let's talk about some principles of Doppler surveillance. First of all, tip shunts are not always the easiest things to monitor. There are a couple perspectives that we have found useful at our institution. Either the high anterolateral intercostal approach, the low intercostal approach, or the subcostal subxiphoid approach should demonstrate the length of the shunt. But of course, there are still problems. This, these shunts tend to be de deeply situated, so we're imaging at considerable depth. There's often a limited window. Suboptimal sound transmission, as the cirrhosis itself causes sound attenuation. There's often a moving target because many of these patients are unable to hold their breath adequately. And uh, also, the orientation of the shunt relative to the sound beam is often perpendicular which, of course, limits the amount of Doppler signal that can be obtained. In general, we tend to use a low-frequency probe for its advantages with penetration. Post-tips, the portal pressure then should decline, but hepatic resistance remains elevated. As a result, flow in the, left, in the portal venous branches, and in particular the left portal venous branch, will tend to reverse. It will go away from the liver and towards the shunt in a hepatofugal orientation. Subsequent portal vein branch then, if it reverses and, and, and goes towards the liver and away from the shunt, which is to say hepatopedal, that indicates stenosis of the shunt and, an, and is an important indicator of early shunt dysfunction. Here is an example of, of normal portal venous flow. Here is the flow that occurs post tips. You see that the connection is made between the right portal vein and the right hepatic vein, and the flow within the left portal branch and also the right portal van, branch distal to the shunt reverses. Here is an example of that. You can see uh, the Doppler examination on your left showing flow through the tips, and on the right you can see the blue color of the left portal branch indicating flow away from the liver and towards the shunt. Studies of tips thrombosis have demonstrated that Doppler sonography is very sensitive and specific for complete occlusion. In excess, with sensitivities and specificities well in excess of 95, 96 percentile. Here's an example of complete occlusion. You can see that with power Doppler no flow signal is seen within the shunt. And if you put spectral Doppler on, all you get is this transmitted pulsation from the aorta. Identification of tip stenosis is more problematic, and there is no uniform agreement on the parameters to identify the malfunctioning shunt. As a result, eight different parameters have been developed and proposed. There are three parameters that you can look for pre-shunt, four parameters within the shunt, and one post-shunt. 
The pre-shunt parameters are these. Direction of flow in the left portal vein branch, which is what I just discussed. The reappearance of collateral veins. And a main portal vein velocity lower than 30 centimeters per second.